What's going on, party people? Welcome to episode 21 of the Culture 316 podcast. I am one of your hosts and producers, Jordan Ahisi. And I'm one of your, um, I am your co-host, Mo. <laughs> what is up, people? <laughs> Jesus. We're right? going to start off hot. But anyway, as per usual, if you are watching this on YouTube, be sure to give us a like, a comment, a subscribe. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts or wherever you're streaming your podcasts, rate the podcast, give it five stars, and be sure to join our Discord as well, which is in the link uh, in the bio. There is so much that has happened since our last show. Um, so we're going to get right into it. So first things first, uh, Sammy Zayn is back at it again uh, with his fundraisers for his Sammy for Syria initiative. This time he has a shirt on Pro Wrestling Tees, which is available um, for two weeks. Uh, they went on sale on December 9th. So two weeks from that, I think, is December 23rd. So essentially Christmas Eve, he has a shirt, the My Dog shirt. Uh, and all of the proceeds are going, 100% of the profits are going to the SammyForSyria.com initiative, and that will help fund a mobile clinic that will operate on the ground in Syria and deliver primary medical aid to displaced civilians impacted by the war. Am I reading that description from Pro Wrestling Tees? Absolutely. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sami Zayn is a cut is a Canada native who has Syrian ethnicity. Uh, and I think that this is stuff that he's been doing for a while. And I think it's really, really cool and ethical. So Mo, I just wanted to know what your impressions and thoughts were on Sami Zayn's initiative and his humanitarian works and efforts. He's always been like that. Like one thing I love about Sami is that he's very consistent. Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, he, he definitely um, likes to um, stand for what's right. And um, he's definitely... Again, I, I just love the fact that despite the fact he's a star and you can do anything with your fucking money, he always chooses to do humble things with it, with with his platform and with his money. Um, so I love what he's doing for Syria. I think it's awesome. I think it's amazing. Um, thank you, Sammy. Just thank you for everything you do, man. You're just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I I concur with that statement. Sami Zayn is not only one of the most entertaining pro wrestlers, he's also one of the most ethical. Um, he's always been consistent. He's always taken a stand for things that he's believed in. Uh, for those of you who know or don't know, like anytime they go to Crown Jewel, he's never there. And it's because he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't stand with what's happening over there. And I think that that's very, very admirable considering um, that he could have been making a lot of money and could have been getting a lot of those bonuses that a lot of the other talents get. So I just shout outs to Sami Zayn. Uh, for being consistent, for being thorough, for being ethical, and for his humanitarian works. For those, once again, who are watching or listening, go to Pro Wrestling Tees, that My Dog shirt. There have been so many wrestlers who have already come out and have worn the shirt. Uh, Damage Control was on Twitter. All of them had the shirt on. Becky Lynch wore the shirt. There have been a bunch of other wrestlers who have supported, and I think that this is something really, really important. It's something that we, as a wrestling community, need to support and get behind as well. So buy the shirt. Get it now. Um, but we're going to move on. So one of the there were two big events that happened this past Saturday. One was a uh, Ring of Honor final battle and the other one was NXT deadline. And I kind of wanted to go over uh, the takeaways that we both got from both shows. So starting with uh, Ring of Honor final battle uh 2022 it was the last Ring of Honor pay-per-view of the year. And I wanted to know kind of some of the highlights or the takeaways that you got from it oh jesus um i think everyone has to agree that, that the biggest takeaway was watching the briscoes versus ftr like that match was a lot more gruesome than what i expected it to be like i expected them to tear down the house don't get me wrong but within like i don't know the first minute bro i was watching off of a stream and my shit glitched next thing you know um one of them's already bleeding I think everyone was bloody by the end of it. Hell, the referee got bladed, bro. The referee did a blade job. <laughs> like, the match was insane. It was over the top. There was spots that, like, literally just had me just cringing. That whole spot where they done tucked the, uh, the dog collar and then had one of the briscoes flying over, I think, into, like, a bed of chairs or some shit. That made me cringe. I think he went through a table. Another time, I was like, bro, like, does no one care about their backs and their necks here? Like, the match was amazing. I was just, like, concerned. I was really concerned right. for these men's lives. I was just like, damn, I'm going to see a casualty by the end of this. Mm -hmm. But it was great. The only thing that shocked me was who went over. I expected since FTR is coming with all these belts that they would try to 
keep, you know, they would try to keep a momentum with them since we do see them on AEW. I thought it was odd booking to have the Briscoes go over. And I think that's their second match, right? And they yeah. lost twice to on um, the Briscoes. So I thought the booking was odd for that. Do you have a do you think there's a reasoning behind that? So I think that the actually I think FTR won the first match. I think that's how they won the the Ring of Honor tag team titles. Because I if you remember, they um the Briscoes kind of got like a quiet release from Ring of Honor and they went to Impact for for a little bit. And um but FTR, I think, won the belts from them a year prior at the previous final battle. And so I think it was a kind of like a full circle moment. I think that, like, I I thought it was a shocking decision because, you know, obviously the Briscoes have been under fire uh, for, um, you know, <laughs> I'm not even going to get into it. Actually, no, I'm going to get into it. Just like the racist stuff and all that. Um, they They were under fire, and I think that Warner... I think that Warner had a problem with doing things relating to the Briscoes because of their reputation. And so I thought that they were going to keep the belts off of the Briscoes and try to keep the Briscoes away from Ring of Honor for that matter. Um, so I was very shocked about very. like that little that little booking decision. Um, but yeah, I was I, I actually don't know why they went with that with that the, with that decision. Great match. Great ending. I'm not complaining at all, but. I I just I felt like on a on a PR standpoint that they were going to try and not put the belts on the Briscoes because of their their past and we don't know what the resolution has been with that. Um, but did you have any other takeaways or highlights? Think Tony from, would ever sign them uh, to to AEW probably not to Ring of Honor probably. Um, but that all really depends, in my opinion, on the TV situation. Right. Like based on where they signed or the TV deals, I feel like Tony Khan wants to have the Briscoes signed to a Tony Khan wrestling property. However, if they're trying to do a TV deal with Warner, they're probably not going to want to pick up Ring of Honor as a television product if the Briscoes are signed to Ring of Honor. So I think that it really kind of depends on the TV situation, which which I, I assume is going to is either being worked out or will work itself out in the future. Um, but did you have any other like takeaways or highlights from that event or? Oh yeah, definitely. Because, okay. So everyone knows that on Twitter, I stay, I stay shaming Wheeler cause I can't stand him. <laughs> I think he's the most unintimidating wrestler I had ever seen. He gives me very like punchable face vibes as with Sammy Guevara, I just find him just annoying. Like, great in the ring, he just is annoying. From the second he opens up his mouth on the mic, I, I'm just disinterested. And he had this a match with Daniel Garcia, and I was trying to look up what the match name was because it slipped my mind, but they had pure stipulations, essentially. Yeah. And Sorry? It was the pure rules the match, match for the – pure rules for the pure title, so. Yeah, and they had like this brilliant, fun match that I never seen before. Where, um, you know, you you if you use up all your your rope breaks, you're kind of fucked, and you just gotta rely off the fact like, can you can you withstand? Can you get out of this this submission hold? If they, if they put you into submission hold, or if you get pinned or whatnot, can you like reverse your way out of it? It was fun for me as a viewer. Like again, I never seen that type of match before. Um, and it gave me by the end of it. I wasn't even mad that Wheeler went over because of just how like entertaining that match was. Like I had like my full attention because I didn't I didn't know who who it could go to. There were so many ways to book a match like that. And mm -hmm. I never seen that in wrestling. So that to me had to be like my second favorite match on the card. Like again, like in the beginning, I was like, oh, it's a Wheeler match, fuck that shit. But then I'm like, oh, Daniel Garcia is in there. All right, let me just give him like a few minutes of my time. But I was fully like invested. Like and I wasn't expecting Wheeler to go over because I think that what by the end of it, he lost all his rope breaks. Or some shit like that. And then he just pulls some out of his ass and won. I was like, whoa, this is fun. Like, I would like to see that match concept elsewhere. I would like to see that in AEW or WWE. So I thought that was fun, fresh. Um, thirdly, um, Athena winning. I I missed half the match, but I did see half of it towards the ending. And I, I thought that was amazing that um, Athena finally got something because I feel like it's been long overdue since, since she had gold. And I don't count that little title run she had in NXT. I don't think anyone cared for it. And it's because essentially no one cared for those NXT belts. In, in, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think they care for the tag team belts over there for the females. I feel like it's a non-factor. You know what I mean? But like I like her as a singles competitor. 
a lot. So I love the fact that, you know, they gave her something to work with. Um, so that that was fun. That that was good for me. That was good for me. The other match that I liked too, despite the fact that the logic app pissed me off, was um Keith Lee and Swerve versus I forgot their names, but it was a big Shane Taylor and, and I forgot, yeah. Yeah, like that match was actually really fun. Um, I got a little more context from other people that um, I think it was Shane Taylor. That's the bigger guy. Yeah. Him and Keith Lee used to be tag team buddies or something. I was trying to understand why was the crowd like getting excited when they were in the ring for five seconds and then they tagged their partners in. And then when I saw them like like moving with each other. I'm like, oh, this is a fun match. Like it, it gave it gave you a little bit of like everything. You had some big man spots. You know, you had the smaller spots with like Swerve, and then the other guys like an MMA. At least it looked like he was like built like an MMA fighter or something. So it had given me a lot of variation. Yes, the logic got pissed me off. I'm just like, bro, didn't y'all just like beef two weeks ago and split on AEW pay per view? Why are y'all tag teaming? That pissed me off. That still pisses me off. However, the match itself was really fucking good. I loved it. To be honest, I went in there with less expectations for ROH. I came out thinking, damn, like. What, how, what the fuck is NXT going to do? <laughs> what are they going to do? I saw nobody talking about Deadline. There was no anticipation. No one was hyping it up. It was dry. Timeline dry. But everyone was going in about that Briscoe match and stuff like that. So I was just like, damn, Triple H better think of something. <laughs> something. So we're going to get into that afterwards. But what was your whole take on the ROH pay-per-view? So I, I kind of agree with everything that you just said. I think that another big thing for me was um, Athena, I think, was like the first time where there was like an AEW to Ring of Honor storyline where there was a, a satisfactory payoff, meaning that like mm -hmm. this all started with Athena losing to Jade, right? And then you saw her go into dark and then she turned heel and then became more aggressive. And then Mercedes called her out and then Mercedes and Athena had the, the match and Athena won. So there's payoff. There was a, a route to the story. There was a climax and there was a resolution. I thought that that was great. I feel like if Tony does that more, I would just really, really enjoy it. If you're going to bring talent from AEW to Ring of Honor, there needs to be some form of payoff or some type of character change or something. There needs to be some form of satisfactory payoff. And I think that that was the case for Athena. As far as the Swerve Keith Lee match, I got the logic. Sir, Swerve wanted the chance to turn on Keith the way that Keith turned on Swerve, meaning he wanted to be the, uh, the ability to kind of walk out the way that Keith kind of walked out on him just so that he can hurt him as much as Keith hurt him. So I get it because now, now the next time they get in the ring, it's definitely going to be on the terms of the beginning of their feud. So I felt like that was a good way to kind of establish that and to kind of give a little bit of nuance and layer to, 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 to Swerve's character. Obviously the Briscoe's match was the highlight of the night. Um, and it sucks because like there was a whole, like, there were so many things that were going on that were just as like intriguing. For example, Brian Cage and the embassy winning the six man tag titles, right? You had Jericho and Cesaro, which we didn't even get into. <laughs> there was a whole world title match where Jericho tapped out to Cesaro and like that was a big deal as well. So now Cesaro is now the ring of honor world champion Daniel Garcia lost the, the pure title to Wheeler. So now, so now the Blackpool Combat Club is they they're back to having championship goal, which was a big takeaway. But that Briscoe's match was so was so gruesome and so good that like I think that people forgot all those other things happened. But it's gonna be very interesting to kind of see what happens next. Um because and we're gonna get to it later in the show because Tony, Tony Khan has some ROH TV announcements and I'm very very intrigued to see where they go. But we're moving on to the second show of the day, which was NXT Deadline. Even though I it was on social media the less popular show, there were a lot of interesting things that happened. But I wanted to know kind of your take on your takeaways from NXT Deadline. What were some standout moments to you? 
Okay, so going in there, um, I don't want to say I had no expectations, but, you know, like, we, this was basically the test dummy, the guinea pig, to see will this stick or not in replacement to War Games, since that's been transferred over to the main roster. Um, and I felt as though, like, first going in, seeing, uh, 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 seeing the females and then the males soul survivor match at first when i saw the females on the list i wouldn't say that i was completely disinterested but i didn't expect them to show out the way that they were showing out and what i loved about both their matches between like the males and the females was that um they both gave you two completely different acts going on like Mm -hmm. with the female um soul survivor yes it's 25 minutes long it didn't feel like 25 minutes it actually felt like much faster because there was so much going on inside. So when it came to like the females compared to like the males, I noticed that the females spend more time outside the pod and they only had one woman normally in the pod, but they still had so much going on, the camera changing all over the place. Um, I thought it was great. I thought the right person did go over. The only thing that is my biggest critique about the show is how Kiana was robbed of having at least one submission or pin. That really pissed me off. I was just like, if if you have to go out, if you have to like rethink about who really put on the show out of all the women, Kiana, there's been clips shared of Kiana, her doing flips, her doing locks, her, um, her just showing off her athleticism. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of people by the end of it, even if she didn't win, there was a payoff for everyone in there, but especially Kiana. I don't think people were paying much mind to her. And like, yes, Roxanne won and she rightfully won. It only made sense because they have this um, um, feud going on still with her and, and Cora J that's supposed to be long-term. You know what I mean? And we watched her head spin. The girl that she literally left turned heel on, you know what I mean, has gotten the championship before her. The one thing she's been, not even the champion, the, the, the opportunity to go win a championship and then later on go get it, but we're going to get into why she got it later on. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was so many moving parts going on, going into it that it was just, yeah, I liked it a lot. I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting. Um, compared to the men, the men was more slower. It was more methodical. But there was more storytelling going on with the men's, um, especially with Grayson Waller, especially with Grayson Waller. If I didn't respect that man before, I especially respect him after watching that match. He gave me complete edge vibes. This is not me being just because I'm, I'm an edge mark. It's just like he's such an opportunist dickhead. And he went <laughs> about everything in such the most logical way. Like if you were playing a video game, he got the last... He got the the highest amount of submissions or pinfalls that you needed. And then he looked at the clock and said, fuck that. Why am I going to keep wrestling? I'm going to dodge all you motherfuckers. And he ran. I'm like, yo, that's the exact thing I would do if I was in the video game. I love it. I love when wrestling is logical. Right. (laughs) I loved it. The storytelling was great. I like how they had all the men literally neck and neck, except for one. Who who, who was the person that was dead last, who just didn't have a chance? I forgot who it was. Axiom. Yeah, Axiom, which uh, he needs to change that name. It sounds like a chemistry term or something. Is it a chemistry term? Like, what like the a, fuck like is an Axiom? Like an like a, a element on the periodic table? It does. It, it does give me those vibes. It, yeah, like, that's such a weird name. And I did not like his entrance. Can I just talk shit about it? What the fuck was up with this whole fake-ass flash shit going on where he was acting like he was moving fast? And then, like, like bitch. <laughs> I liked it. That part, I liked it. That, that was the worst. I'm not sure if that was the first time he ever debuted. I think I'm assuming he was on the show before that to get on the, the uh, Soul Survivor fucking match card. But I, it was my first time watching. I was like, yo, what, what is this entrance? <laughs> like, it's like the exact opposite of like the slow mo entrance that they would have with Mandy or they had with John Morrison. They just had this man fake acting like the Flash, like he's in many places. And then they skipped him walking down to the ramp because they knew that that'd be a logic gap for him. Mm-hmm. And his entrance, they just can't cut. Then the camera cut to the ring with him still doing the fast shit, just for him to be in slow motion in real time during the match. It was just throw out the gimmick for the love of God, throw it out. He's a great in ring competitor. I will give Mm -hmm. him that. He intrigued me in the ring, but that whole packaging of him, 
I was like, uh, uh-uh. uh, like he, no, 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 toss it out, toss it out. But did the right person win? Yes, I think that it only made sense that since we gave it to a baby face for the females, that a male had to win. A heel. So not yeah. not another male. That a heel had to heal a win for the males. That 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 was good. That was perfect because it tells two different stories moving on with both divisions or both people that were contenders. And yeah, we're gonna get into what happened with the girls, but at least more um storytelling when you give it to a heel. It always does. Right. It always does. So that was great. And then we had some matches um outside of that. Uh the first one that came to my mind <laughs> was the was the main event with Apollo and Braun Breaker. And it's because my brain can't seem to turn off that awkward camera angle we got of Apollo. <laughs> where and he the, had the crazy eyes. <laughs> that yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Like it looked like he was in the middle of an exorcist or something. I was like, what is happening here? And I low key wanted Apollo to win because I love Braun Breaker. I think he's great. I thought the feud Same. was a little bit lazy of a setup. Um, it was awkward because you have a 25 year old, and I'm assuming Apollo's in his 30s or whatnot. Y'all had this weird setup of these young men going fishing and stuff like that. I was just like, they're they're young. What young people are going fishing? I just thought it was weird. The whole setup with them feuding was weird and lazy, but the match itself showed out. I just would have preferred if, like I said, Apollo would have went over just simply because what more does Braun Breaker, like, need to do in NXT? I don't know. Like, I don't know who they're trying to set up besides Grayson Waller. So, but didn't, didn't they already, didn't they already come in contact with each other? With uh, Grayson mistaken. Waller and uh and Braun, I'm not. Do I have com- a one v one yet? I'm not sure. I'm not completely sure. I think that they did, but I think that it was either before Braun was champion, before Grayson was like really established. Okay. So it was it was either. I guess or. so they've been. Okay, because I just feel like they've been spending a lot of time with this whole Grayson Waller thing, and he lost me at some point. But after what he did. In that Soul Survivor match, I would actually love to see him, and I would love to see like a heel champion because now we got two babyface champions, which I'm not saying makes the show boring, but you do need to have some balance here. Mm-hmm. So it leads me to think that next pay per view, Braun's definitely like losing in some shape, way, or form because like you kind of have to now. Um, what was the other two matches from um, New Day versus from, Pretty from Deadly, Deadline. New Day versus oh. Pretty Deadly, and uh, Isla Dawn versus Alba Fire? That was he. That was he. Actually, if it weren't for the Soul Survivor, that would have been my favorite match. The New Day versus Pretty Deadly. That was fun. That was fun as shit. And I thought that it made them look good. And mind you, I I wasn't really high on Pretty Deadly. I didn't really care for them. But the New Day, they're, they're in my opinion, one, one of the greatest tag teams out there. Um, they always manage to bring the best qualities out of their competitors. And they most definitely show that out with Pretty Deadly. They had amazing chemistry. There were some funny parts in the match. There were some serious parts in the match. Um, but ultimately, I did think that the belts did go to the right people. I see a lot of like flack on social media about people being upset about the New Day having them. Because it's just like, well, the New Day always has the belts. Why do they have to have you know belts in NXT? I feel like that's good because... NXT is still underneath reconstruction, all right? Mm. It's been having um a, a bit of a personality mishap over the last year. So I feel like since they're underneath construction and now they went from bouncing back and forth between treating like a developmental brand or a 1.5 brand or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Now that they're treating it like a tertiary brand now, I feel like it's good to actually bring talents that we regularly see that are, that are mainstream to NXT to bring some importance and some legitimacy not only to the belts but like get some viewers to come over and start watching NXT you know what I mean mm. um you know and I, I feel like when it comes to the tag teams down there they aren't bad I wouldn't say that they're bad but I think what they're probably missing is I feel like what they're missing down there is that they don't have any storylines for the tag teams that make you care. Like they have a lot of interesting characters or whatnot, but they don't really have like any substance. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It's missing something. Like, do, do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, There's like yeah, some, yeah. some ingredient that is missing. Do you, do, do you know what it is? 
I, I I'm think... watching it. I don't get it, but it made sense when the, when the new day came down. And it felt like there was a missing piece, and they came and fixed it. They were I missing. Can't, I can't make it into words. They were missing star power, and they were missing star power and tag team quality and depth. So they have good like for what NXT two two point was going for as far as being going back to developmental. The tag teams, okay, cool. They were what they were. They are what they are. It's fine. But if you're going to a tertiary yeah. brand, something that's comparable to SmackDown or Raw, think of NXT when it was 1.0 and who they had at their disposal. You had Undisputed Era, you had FTR, you had DIY, you had Authors of Pain, you had Imperium. NXT used to have one of the deepest tag team divisions in the world of any brand, Raw, SmackDown, AEW, New Japan, a lot of great tag teams were in NXT. And then on top of that, the stories that were behind them and the match qualities that they, like FTR and DIY in Toronto is a banger, all-time classic. But I feel like now that NXT is reestablishing themselves as a primary brand, you have to increase the star power of the tag teams in that division. You have to increase the depth and you have to fill that, fill that division up with quality teams because you need foil for the up and coming teams. You need something for them to go up against. So I think that the new day brings all of that. The new day brings prestige. The new day brings quality. The new day brings depth. Um, and, 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 and I feel like there's a lot of good stories that they can be, that they can tell with the tag teams down there, but back to you. And, no, you could. If, I mean, I know you had a lot to say about the new day, and you had a lot to say about the other matches. Um, so, all right. So, I'll give my. I'll give my. I'll. I'll go. I'll go with my little highlights and takeaways. So, I do believe that Deadline is probably going to be a staple NXT pay per view moving forward because the Deadline match was fantastic. I loved it. It. It had the. It. It. it it was very engaging. It was very, very captivating. It did not bore me for a second. And the moment that it felt like something was like things were slowing down, a new entrant would come in or somebody would get pinned or somebody would submit and somebody would have to go into the penalty box. And I feel like between the two women and men's matches, we were able to see the stories that can be told, right? You know, you have a Roxanne, you had like the women and they were kind of all tied up at one. And then it really just kind of came down to the last second. And then you had a Grayson Waller and, you know, you had a Grayson Waller who, you know, not only went up a couple pinfalls, but now had a strategy as far as how to navigate the rest of the match so that he didn't really have to work, but nobody else caught a pinfall. So there are so many ways that a story can be told through that deadline match. And I think that that's what I was looking for. And I think that we're going to see um, more of these matches going forward. And I think this is going to be a staple. Now, the whole thing with Kiana James, right? I believe that the fact that she had a standout performance and no pinfalls is going to be the thing that develops her character. Because now we want to see her win. Now we want to see her more. Had she gotten a pinfall, I don't think that we would have had that factor. Because it's like, okay, she got a pinfall like everybody else. So she's cool. But like the fact that she didn't get a pinfall, it's like almost in a way she kind of lost. And now that that, that further develops her character. And I feel like because she had such a great performance and no pinfalls, I think that that gives us something to watch for in the next year. So that next deadline, we hope that she's in the match and we hope that she wins it. Because it's like last year... In last year, she didn't have any pinfalls. So now we want to see her win the whole thing because we know what she can do in the ring. So then there's that. Um, as far as the other matches, Isla Dawn, Alba Fire, good match. Good match. I don't know what they're going to do with Alba Fire now, but I think that they need to turn her heel. I think that that's the next big step because you lose the title, you lose to another top heel in the division, and that top heel... Or that heel that she lost to wasn't even really in line for a title shot. Roxanne was in line for a title shot. And so now it just puts her further down the pecking order. So it's like, how is she going to, you know, sustain kind of a, a level in that division if she's losing so much? Um, 
And I feel like she needs a little bit of a character change. She needs a little bit of a heel turn because she's been the good girl for so long and it's gotten her nowhere. And I think that this is the perfect time for her to turn heel because we know what Kaylee Ray could do as a heel. Well, Alba Fire. We know what she can do as a heel. She was incredible in NXT UK as a heel. So that was a little oh, yeah, bit of what I was. She pissed me off in that Tony Storm match. When yeah. Tony lost the belt to her, I was pissed at her. Yeah, I yo. Her Cats hated her. Like, <laughs> She like, but she, but that shows you how much heat that she can draw, and she didn't have to go with the lowest hanging fruit. In addition to that, here's what I will say: I felt like the whole Apollo Cruz moment didn't make sense if he didn't win. Why would you sell us on a character change if his character change wasn't going to lead him to a, a, a outcome that was going to benefit him? That did nothing. That did absolutely nothing. Him going and him losing just made him look dumber because it's just like, bro, bro really did all of that. Broly really, bro, he like, bro got woke in the middle of the match to lose in the match. Like, if, he, if you're gonna, if you're gonna lose, if you're gonna go that route, win the match, have him win the match. It needs, I, I feel like pivotal moments like that need a payoff. Right, because like now, what is he gonna do? Is he gonna go into every other match? And it's like, but it's like, uh oh, you know what happened last time that happened? Yeah, he lost the last time that happened. So why am I fearing, or why am I like getting like like ominous if his eyes get big and he turns serious? If the last time he turned serious, he didn't win the match. So I just felt like there were things that they could have done to make that better. And I feel like Apollo could have won that match if the whole idea was for him to have a drastic character change or for him to have another side to him. Like, it, that to me was dumb. And I normally don't call stuff dumb, but that, yeah. was, that was just dumb. But, yeah, I, I, th those are my little NXT takeaways. And our those are our NXT. Yeah, those are our NXT deadline takeaways. But we want to know what y'all feel about it. So let us know in the comments below but moving on so shortly after the ring of honor final battle show um there was a final battle media scrum um where tony khan made a ring of honor television announcement he said that ring of honor tv will be available on honor club as a standalone service for 9.99 a month and he cited that there will be multiple aew ring of honor and new japan pro wrestling crossovers um, do you believe, I wanted to know, do you believe that this move has anything to do with not receiving a television deal? Or do you think that something big is on the way? Mm, I think, I think that they're, they're trying to still get people to care more about, you know, um, ROH. So Gotta get close to the I mic. Like by lumping them together. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm over here being mad. <laughs> um, I feel like, yeah, that word. Um, I feel like um, there was a lot of disinterest for ROH, you know, obviously up until the pay per view, and I feel like they set that up on purpose. Like, all right, it didn't really. It, I feel like Tony Khan kind of realized that it was a bit of a failed experiment with him trying to push our, uh, the ROH titles and all that stuff on the AEW program, and I felt like, all right. Let's give them their own pay-per-view. You know, let's tear the house down with that pay-per-view and let's just lump it together with what the crowd knows and, and where these people were pulled from, you know, the mainstream um, promotions. And I feel like, you know, the same way we kind of fell in love with like the WWE network and how, if it's anything like the WWE network, I feel like it's brilliant because a lot of people like had a, how to explain, it? I feel like they had a bit of like an attachment to it being able to have access to watch any of the matches that they wanted to watch and the way the, the way the WWE network used to let you like pinpoint parts in the match that you could just skip to and stuff like that. Um mm -hmm. there's just a lot of like accessibility as a fan through like the WWE network. So if they're trying to mirror what they're doing over there, I feel like that's kind of smart to just lump them together for now. Um they'll be able to I guess track down what people are tuning into. And this maybe just down the line when they could get like their numbers up with the interest, they could work out getting another deal. Cause I feel like again, they they've definitely left quite an impression with what they did on Saturday. So I don't 
I don't want to say like anything was a full felt experiment. I just feel like he's trying like a little detour over here. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I'm still streaming, bitch. I ain't paying no nine ninety nine. But what is <laughs> what is your take on this? I'm gonna make that into a shirt. Um, so I think that uh, <laughs> here's my thing. I feel like over the past year, there's been speculation about a possible Ring of Honor television deal and i feel like they may have gotten offers or they may not have but i feel like they may have gotten offers and they just never got the right deal or what tony khan believed to be fair for what he was bringing to the table with ring of honor and um because of that the deal didn't work out and that's part of one of re one of the reasons why i think he was comfortable with letting the briscoes win the tag titles because now he doesn't really have as of right now he doesn't really have anybody to kind of adhere to or listen or or to respond to that would tell him hey those guys need to be off the brand so now that he has that flexibility um i think that that's kind of a sign that he does not have a tv deal in place however i do think that something big is on the way because if you if you know i pay attention to a lot of the stuff that's happening with media and wrestling outside of wwe as well i do know that AEW dynamite and rampage is available for streaming on um new japan's streaming site which is new japan world and i feel like because new japan has a u.s product with new japan strong we can possibly see a partnership between new japan strong and honor club within the near future in addition to that i also believe that there are things that are going to be happening over the next couple of months that are really going to shake the room there have been you know obviously like kenny omega is going to be working wrestle kingdom ftr is going to be working wrestle kingdom and there have been rumors of tanahashi and naito possibly working the seattle show for dynamite uh in early january and so I think that, number one, we're starting to see the AEW New Japan Pro Wrestling Partnership really start to blossom and take full effect. And I believe that if New Japan and AEW are going to have a blossoming partnership, Ring of Honor is naturally going to be involved. So I think that in the near coming months, Honor Club is going to be a lot more valuable than it was when it was just a Ring of Honor thing because we're going to see a little bit of everything on Honor Club. You're going to have the, the Ring of Honor tape library, which speaks for itself. You're going to have um, uh, you're going to have original programming from ROH. You're probably going to have some New Japan programming. And then you're also going to have AEW stars probably appear on both products. So I think that we're going to start seeing kind of like that, that threefold of, of, of superstar of, of brands on this platform and i think that it's going to to make it extremely valuable compared to where it was before and considering what we also heard about a certain someone possibly showing up a new japan i think that this is going to benefit them very well in the long run uh but moving on from that because man <laughs> pw insider last week literally we dropped the show last Friday and then this news came out and I was tight because I, I wanted to talk about it. But Pro Wrestling Insider reported that Mercedes Varnado, a.k.a. Sasha Banks, will be appearing at New Japan Pro Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom 17. This is huge. This is monumental. This is iconic. Um. I wanted to know what your impressions of of Sasha Sasha Banks Mercedes Mo Monet whatever you want to call her about her possible appearance in New Japan's biggest event of the year and what this means for her career is she going to be in is she going to be a Japan girl full time is she going to go back to WWE do you, like what what do you think is happening what's going on Um obviously the news caught me off guard um because Sasha is for two things. She is definitely, yes, for herself because she understands her self-worth and what, like, she brings to the table um, as a pro wrestler, especially as a black um, woman's pro wrestler. But um, she's also here for wrestling in general. 
Um, and <clears throat> anywhere she touches is going to become gold. Any any um crop of 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 like soil that she touches is going to just grow and flourish with Sasha Banks there. But one thing about Sasha is she's going to go where the money goes. And I was reading reports about how she's only signed for like that date or maybe a couple dates because they allegedly didn't have the funds that she is requesting because she wants to get paid a hefty amount. Um, From one report I saw with WWE, I mean, she want to get paid like Brock Lesnar. And when I checked Brock Lesnar's net worth, not net worth, his WWE salary, it was like $12 million or something as of 2022. And I think Sasha... I think Sasha's net worth is three million when I checked, and then her salary um, from twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two was two hundred and forty thousand dollars, which I thought was vastly underpaid for the amount of like stuff that she puts her body through and the bumps, um, putting people over, constantly being screwed over. I could, I could see why she left. I honestly thought she was getting paid more, like at least a million. So that really threw me off that I saw that amount. Um, but going back to my original point, um, I love this for her. Um, I know that she's for women and she's for pro wrestling. Um, she definitely like respects uh, Joshi wrestlers, but I always see her training with them. So it didn't throw it didn't throw me off too much that she went over there. But it's it goes to show you how big of a star it is that she literally just been gone all these months and now she's popping up in Japan's WrestleMania equivalent. And she is going to be the star. And like the thing about the thing about Sasha is that she has such like a large dedicated fan base that's willing to go wherever she goes. Like the crew is a, the crew is the equivalent of the barbs when it comes to Sasha. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't think we ever seen this before when it came to any like female talent, where like fans are so in love so in love with a talent that no matter what they do, what business venture they go on, they're clocking it and they are here to support it. So if anything, I feel like WWE probably got their ears up like a dog on high alert. Like, oh my God, we might be losing her if they like cut her the right check. Cause not for nothing. There's a lot of people I know who don't watch um, new Japan because it's very much different than the format of WWE. But there's people who love Sasha so much, they're willing to tune into that and give them all those ratings and keep up just because it's not even so much about New Japan, it's about Sasha. But that's the thing, that's what they're they're thinking in Japan. Let's get the biggest star, the biggest star that's in WWE and going to be on um, one of the biggest mainstream acts elsewhere. Because, you know, again, our girl's modeling, she got a CBD business and stuff like that. Um, like, she she doing everything. I don't even know what else she's doing. I just know she got a list going. Her resume is ever growing and ever extending. Mm-hmm. But she is the star power over there. So people are coming over thinking that I'm just gonna watch Mercedes, and you might just get a whole a whole bunch of new fans that are just like, wow, like the rest of the show actually wasn't bad. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I could watch some of this, or this might be better than WWE. You know, if Sasha goes, then hell, I'm gonna go, and I'm I'm just get with this. There's so much risk that comes with this. And it's just mind boggling to me that WWE, excuse me, someone's calling me. They need to not. Um, when it comes to, um, what should I call it? When it comes to Sasha and WWE, it's just mind boggling to me that she just wouldn't pay the woman wherever the hell she wanted. Cause you guys have the money. Y'all have the fun. I don't, I, I don't, I don't see why you wouldn't pay her at this point with literally what she's done in the empire. She's built away from WWE. It's just mind boggling because I mean, again, wherever she goes, like that company is going to blow up. And right now, it's the the ball's really in anyone's park. Um, I'm not sure who's responsible for all the signings. I'm not sure if this is solely a Triple H thing. I'm not sure if it's anything that's holding him back from saying yes to that 12 million ish salary that she was looking for. But it really is up in the air because she could go to New Japan, but New Japan's also in relations to AEW. You know, like they they clearly communicate one another. She could just show up over there, put on a star-studded performance, and been in contact with Tony Khan the entire time. And she's just like, "Yeah, Sasha, I love this um Mercedes Monet thing that you got going on. This is money. You know what I mean? Like, tell me what number, and I'm gonna cut you the check because we know that Tony Khan got the bread. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like, we know he got the bread. You know, 
Like, it's really like a matter of like, who's, who, who's going to listen and give her what she wants. And I love this for her because I think I said this last week and this kind of shook the table, but I was saying that Sasha Banks's legacy is bigger than a Trish Stratus or what an AJ Lee did. And I say this mainly because like, we never had like a woman come into so much power that wasn't meant to be in this much power. Like mm. Trish Stratus, for example, I love her. I love her. I adore her. I adore her for everything she has done for women's wrestling. But when it comes to Trish Stratus, um, she was set up to be that girl regardless because we know that Vince has a certain type. He loved the way Sable looked. Um, and when Sable's on the way out, Trish was kind of all the way all already there to fulfill that valet ish eye candy position. And of course, Trish took it upon herself over time to fall in love with the business and learn the ropes and become this star that we know of today. And obviously she has like last lasting impressions on um other, you know, on on, on future uh talents. You know what I mean? AJ Lee wasn't meant <laughs> to be important. She just became important because like, you know, she she had some some presence about her that was just so gravitating, so likable, so just um relatable that people naturally just fell in love with her and they had to book her the way that they were booking her because i mean like you can't the, the fans dictate the business the fans ultimately like we kind of make a decision on how shit's gonna go down for these wrestling shows you know what i mean because if we don't mm -hmm. like something we won't let you know you know we saw we saw that we like aj and they booked aj and yeah she did what she did when it came to the whole um what should we call it um, give divas a chance movement you know what i mean she took her platform and um, in that short time frame that she was there in wwe she did manage to create a big change to where yeah there's more focus being placed on divas and women in general and being taken seriously so what they do in, in respect of their eras i will i will definitely commend them for i'm not saying that by any means that like they didn't do nothing for their era but what they could have done in their eras with the restrictions they had they definitely made impacts and they did pave the way for sasha but the thing about sasha compared to the other two is that like if aj lee didn't leave and she actually continued wrestling whether it was in another promotion or not perhaps she would have had fans that followed but the thing about sasha is i never seen people so committed to someone to where they could leave and we're waiting like puppies at the door for her to come back you know what I mean? It's like, where's Sasha? Where's Sasha? Like, oh, she's doing CBD. Let me go ahead and follow this page. I don't give a shit. I don't know nothing about it, but I'm going to follow it just because I need to see what Sasha's doing. You know what right. I mean? She went ahead and she did the New York Fashion Week. I saw men tapping into that. Men that don't even care about fashion tapping into that because it's Sasha Banks. We want to see what she's doing. You know what I mean? People heard she was making music, attempting to make music. They're over here investigating. When she tried to not post nothing on her social media for all these months or whatever. Um, people were like trying to reverse search, trying to, trying to figure out her whereabouts. Like they love her. Like they are obsessed with her. And that comes with the power of Sasha because she wasn't meant to be great. Out of the four horsewomen, you could tell that Vince wanted Charlotte at the top. He always mm -hmm. wanted Charlotte at the top. And he always booked Sasha to be beneath or to, uh, put over other talent that he wanted in the driver's seat, like Alexa or, anyone that was a, that other equivalent. She wasn't meant to be that great, but the fans obviously connected with Sasha. We wouldn't give up on Sasha. And, you know, it took her leaving and taking things upon herself for some changes to happen around here. Because again, one thing I love about Miss Sasha Banks is she's not just for herself. She's for pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's the biggest difference between her and this whole CM Punk hiatus thing. She's like, she left with a purpose. you like, you know that when she's coming back, she's coming back because she's trying to elevate not only herself, but she's paving the way for black women as well. Right. Because again, she was not supposed to be at the top. She did not fit the criteria about what what WWE likes in a, a top female talent. She did not fit that criteria at all whatsoever. But she but she has a presence that's so loud that could not be unheard. And now she's bigger than that company. And now you have three companies that are fighting for their lives, trying to get Sasha Banks in back back into their corner, because they know again. Wherever she goes, they're losing a big, a big chunk of fans. I know people that are hanging on by like their, <laughs> by like the skin of their teeth, watching WWE because they're waiting for her to come back or they're waiting for Naomi to come back. Mm -hmm. That dedicated, that dedicated, 
we have not seen that with a female talent. She is just as big as like The Rock or John Cena, and it's like it's crazy. Like I'm I'm mind boggled. I'm I just it's like yo, she's powerful. She's really powerful. So I'm sorry to go off on a whole tangent, y'all, but it's just like I just I love her. Like I love everything that she's really been doing. Like I never seen a woman really just like take a hold of her life in the direction of her career. And like literally everyone is like waiting to see what's her next move because I want to be invested. I want to be invested. I want to follow on the journey. Trish hasn't done that. AJ Lee hasn't done that. Her legacy really is untouchable for for the females. And I love that because she she really like had set the bar so high with this that it's it's making other people think. It's making other people think. And we won't get into the Mandy situation. Because mm-hmm. she kind of inspired her to think that, all right, I don't really need this. I really don't need this. I could take what I did here, you know what I mean, and 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 make more of myself. I could be more than just this box that I'm in with WWE. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Sorry, but I'm not whole entire tangent. It's just, bruh, like, damn, Sasha Banks, damn. Right? <laughs> you're you're good. I'm gonna say what I need to say quickly because we're on time. But um, here's I'm what sorry. I will say about the whole Sasha Banks and Wrestle Kingdom 17. Number one, one can assume that she's probably going to be wrestling. One can assume that it's going to be for the IWGP World Women's Championship. One can assume she's going to have a match against Kyrie. One can assume that's mm-hmm. co- probably going to be the main event. If that happens, that means that she's going to be the first woman to main event Wrestle Kingdom 17, Wrestle Kingdom and WrestleMania. That's huge. That's wow. number one. Number two, WWE played with their food and now they're going to starve. Let's just let's just call it how it is. If WWE signed Mercedes Varnado to a long-term deal with the figure that she wanted, they would have been in complete power and in complete control because obviously she would have operated under the name of Sasha Banks, under the name of whatever WWE wanted or whatever WWE IP that WWE has in control of. Now, this is all about Mercedes which means that she can go to New Japan, she can go to Ring of Honor, she can go to AEW and do her wrestling thing. And whatever she builds over there is going to give her the leverage to probably ask for an even bigger bag if she goes back to WWE. It's been rumored and reported that Sasha Banks' one-time fee of appearing at Wrestle Kingdom 17 exceeds the fee that they paid Chris Jericho. For a Wrestle Kingdom right. appearance, they paid Chris Jericho a hundred grand. So, hundred grand for an appearance. Apparently, Sasha's number exceeded that, and the number's only going to go up as time goes on because Sasha's only going to become more valuable. So then, there's that. Um, I think that this is just a genius, a genius move. Something that's going to shake the wrestling world once again if she actually pops up there and has a match and they do what whatever needs to be done i just mercedes is just like i think that mercedes like you said i think her legacy is going to when it's all said and done surpass trish stratus and aj lee i think that she's going to put herself already had. this the, the the i think that i think that sasha is going to go if she has this match at wrestle kingdom 17 it's it's going to be undisputed that she's probably the best of the four horsewomen and she's probably going to go down as the greatest women's wrestler of all time because there is no woman's wrestler who has had the resume, the run, and the power that Sasha Banks has had. From an in-ring perspective, from an on-mic perspective, from a wrestling company match perspective. And everybody is fair game. She has advocates in every company. She has stories that she can tell in every company. She can go to New Japan and do something with Kyrie. She can go to AEW and it could be a Soraya Sasha thing with a story already built in. You know what I'm saying? She can go to Ring of Honor. She can go up against Athena. Like, she, like there's so many avenues and directions that she can go in, and WWE really should have just cut the check. When it boils down to it, they really should have, whatever the number Sasha wanted, especially now because of the whole Mandy situation, it's just like, okay, so now where is your star power coming from? Charlotte is out. That means that Bianca's just going to have to carry the load. Bailey's just going to have to carry the load. And I know that that's a great, you know, it's great to be a star. It's great to be out in front. But I know that that's going to have a time limit on it. And so you need to have another plan. 
But we're going to move on from that. What, I want I want to know what everybody else feels about a Mercedes appearing at Wrestle Kingdom 17. And speaking of Wrestle Kingdom 17, it's also been reported that Carl Anderson will be reporting for the never open weight championship at Wrestle Kingdom 17, which means that New Japan's biggest event of the year will feature contracted talent from WWE, Impact, AEW, and Ring of Honor. So what do you think that Wrestle, Wrestle Kingdom 17 is going to mean to pro wrestling as a whole, considering that they're going to have Sasha, considering that they're going to have all these talents from all these companies. What does this mean? Jeez. Just, it's just an interesting time to be a pro wrestling fan, bro. Like, I don't think we, I would ever have thought we would see the day that all the, all the worlds would merge into one. Oh, get close to the mic, bro. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, no, I never thought we would see the day that all all the wrestling promotions and worlds would just collide into one. And it's it's crazy because, I mean, we thought that our WrestleMania, you know, uh, with WWE was like the biggest show of the year. Like this, I don't think they're going to be able to top this. I don't think they're going to be able to top this. This might be like the biggest attraction of the entire year. Um, wow. But what do you think about it? Man, I for starters, I think that it's interesting that Wrestle Kingdom is the first um it's the first pay-per-view of the year when it comes to wrestling. It obviously it's New Japan's WrestleMania equivalent, but I think this is going to set the tone for how business should be done in the world of pro wrestling because everybody's eating. Yeah. Right? You have FTR there, Kenny Omega's going to be there, Carl Anderson who is going to be there. Um, Sasha Banks, Mercedes Renato is going to be there. It's the biggest event of the year and prominent talent from every promotion are making an appearance. So now what's stopping a Jay White from being at WrestleMania? What's stopping, a, <laughs> what's stopping, you know, these major talents appearing from appearing at other big shows? Because clearly it's possible. Clearly people can do good business. And so I think that considering that uh, that this is the first show of the year, that it is going to be a two-day event, I think that this is going to set the tone. Like AEW always talked and professed about changing the world of pro wrestling. And I think that they had a major, major part in this. I believe that Forbidden Door had a major, major part in normalizing uh, cross the cross-promotional sharing of talent so that talents from other promotions can appear on other promotions, big, big events. And I think that we need to credit them for, for, for what we're seeing now, but I think this is going to set the tone. And I think that WWE, there's going to be a higher standard held to WWE now because now the expectation is higher. Now it's like, okay, you got these celebrities and that's great. But what about other wrestlers from other promotions? It's possible. It's happened. You can make it happen. It's, it's, Don't you and, think that's bad business long term? How so? Just because then there's no urgency to actually like sign to a certain promotion if everyone could just appear like well, once a I year mean, or a couple times a year. But I mean, think about it like this. That's I think that's the that's you know, business in general, right? It's like I feel like the lines are blurring amongst a lot of different industries, and now it's just a matter of I don't want to be loyal to this one company. I just want to be able to appear here. So it's going to force people to evolve and do business in a different way. Meaning I think that, yeah, okay. People don't want to sign long, people don't want to sign long-term contracts to WWE. So now WWE has to incentivize long-term contracts more, right? New Japan has to incentivize long-term contracts more aw so now the, the the biggest the 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 standout thing in a contract can't be ah oh, i'm gonna get a push or i'm gonna be at wrestlemania no i think we need to explore health benefits i think that we need to explore more money i think we need to explore bigger bonuses that's what happens when you start when business evolves you have to be in a position to create bigger incentives and you now have to make your your place of work so attractive that a long-term contract doesn't seem like a burden it seems like a blessing 
And I think that that's what WWE has to adjust to now. That's what all these promotions have to adjust to now, right? In order to to draw the biggest talent and make the money that you want to make, you got to you got to <laughs> you got to evolve with the times. You have to move with the times. Like look at the whole Cody Rose situation, right? Like Cody got certain time long-term contract. He owns his theme song, he owns his trademarks. That's something that probably would not have been done in WWE 10 years ago. But WWE evolved with the times and they were able to incentivize a long-term contract enough so that Cody wanted to sign there. They have to start doing that with everybody now because now everybody is taking control of their brand and taking control of their future outside of pro wrestling. And now you have to consider more. So I think that it, you know, we're not going to be seeing such a, these are WWE guys, these are New Japan guys, these are Impact guys. I think we're going to see wrestlers that are going to work for multiple promotions and if they want, you know, to want them to sign long term contracts, you're going to have to make it worth their while. You have to throw in more money. You got to do something. So that is my thing on that. But moving on, because speaking of contracts and speaking of WWE, according to Forbes, Vince McMahon is looking to return to WWE in spite of new allegations of sexual assault surfacing. Mm -hmm. According to a report from the Wall Street Journal, Vince McMahon is facing multiple legal demands asserting that he sexually assaulted two women, including Rita Chatterton, a former ref who is the first woman's ref in the history of WWE. It's reported that Vince believes that he received bad advice from people close to him, and he believes he would have been able to withstand the allegations if he just stayed with the company. According to Sean Ross Sapp, WWE execs do not want him back with the companies. But I wanted to know, how would you feel about a potential Vince McMahon return? And do you even believe that that's possible at this point? Uh, No to both. Like, (laughs) no to both. Um, A lot of talents are a lot happier since since he hasn't been here. Um, I feel like Triple H has done great things for the company since he's left um i feel like uh vince mcmahon he has a history of being a vile person it doesn't shock me that more allegations are coming out but he's ultimately too old anyways he but at least before he was a crappy person but he knew good business and he could run a, a good show and he's so far gone he can't he he physically can't do it he makes a lot of irrational decisions that ends up pissing off his own people that he he works with and his writers there's been many reports over the past couple of years of writers spending many hours in rooms and coming up with pieces and then it gets to vince mcmahon and it essentially gets tossed down and they just go with whatever plan he comes up with a few minutes before raw or while raw's airing you know what i mean is that someone that we need as a boss is this what we want <laughs> you know what i mean because as far as I know, Tony Khan's is significantly younger. I think he's in his 30s or his 40s, one or the other. Don't know how old is the person that runs New Japan. But they're obviously younger, fresher minds that are in tuned with what's going on in the world now in modern day wrestling. Vince is stuck in another era. I don't even think he even like remembers all the stuff he's accomplished. You know what I mean? He's just so disconnected with everything. And I think, again, it comes with being overworked and age and the stress of dealing with this so he just needs to deal with that and just let it go let it go it probably is hard for him because he identifies with it because Mm -hmm. literally like you're Vince McMahon that's what we associate you with being the big boss of WWE like it's probably a lot he's probably going through a lot of mental gymnastics with all these allegations and lawsuits here and stuff like that but he just by no means needs to come back to WWE God, no. What do you think? I'm going to echo your statement. I don't believe that he's coming back. I believe that that was one of the reasons why, as soon as he retired, there was such a big move on recreating the power structure in WWE. Like, Let's look at the, the positions of power that, that have been, you know, occupied and filled so we have nick khan and stephanie mcmahon as the co-ceos we have triple h as a as a cco we have Shawn michaels as the head of you know essentially 
occupying Triple H's old position. We have Road Dog in there now. William Regal has been rehired, and he has a, a vice president position that's going to start uh, early in 2023. So when you look at the power structure, and Kevin Dunn is gone, John Laurinaitis is gone, like all these other guys that were under Vince are gone. And so there's been, an, a, a, regardless of how you feel about, about the on-screen product, there has been a dramatic shift in the work culture and work environment of WWE. Stuff like that matters to investors. Stuff like that matters to uh, 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 the board of directors because these are things that improve uh, the ethical substance of the company and make them appear to be morally sound, which is something that drives up brand value, right? So those things are in place. I don't think that Vince McMahon is coming back because I think that the allegations that he's that he's dealing with are too much. And I think that the board of directors are going to make a decision if he decides to, oh, I'm going to return. I think the board of directors are going to make a decision and say, no, because you returning is going to hurt the company. It's going to hurt our stock prices. It's going to hurt uh, the work culture. It's going to hurt so many different facets of the company. You coming back is going to hurt the company. So we're not going to let you back in. And then that's just going to be that. Now, as far as um, I wanted to, to see the, 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 the second question, I, I don't think it, it is. I don't think that it is possible. I don't think it is possible for all the reasons that I just mentioned. Um, I do believe that we're seeing the stage of Vince McMahon in which he has he has heavily identified with something for so long that the moment that he's away from it, he's going through a crisis. And we're seeing it play out in real time. And so I, it's unfortunate, but, and then on top of that, Vice has a doc, either has a documentary coming out or the documentary is already it aired on, huh? It came out, right? So it, it like, you, yeah. dog, <laughs> it's over. There's it's no, <laughs> there's no chance in hell of Vince McMahon coming back. So that's all that I have to say about a Vince McMahon return. But we want to know what you guys believe. If you believe that Vinnie Mac is coming back, which is you got to be on crack to, to believe that. But if you do believe it, let us know. But moving on. But speaking of new eras in WWE, this past Tuesday marked uh, the beginning of a new era as Roxanne Perez became the new NXT Women's Champion, making her the first ever Puerto Rican NXT Women's Champion and the woman who ended Mandy Rose's historic 413-day reign. So I have two questions. How do you feel about her championship win uh, to close the year? And how would you rank Mandy Rose's championship reign amongst, amongst all of the other NXT Women's title reigns? Um, I'm a fan of Roxanne. Um, I think I said this on last week's podcast, but um, she's a great talent. Um, she has a great look. She's very great in the ring. Um, and she she knows how to hold her own for someone like so young and fresh in the business. Like she she's you know obviously been on the indie circuit and whatnot, but she's still like a baby. And it's just like this is big for her. Like this is very big. Yes, um, being that the first Puerto Rican, um female to hold the NXT Women's Championship, but the fact that she's just so young and she's this good right now, it's just like, imagine if you gave it time, you know what I mean? And let that that wine age a bit. Like, she is going to be, in my personal opinion, um, I, I, could, I could honestly see her being, like, on a four-horse woman level definitely down the line just because she... There's something special about her. If she had the right gimmick, like, you would see the full vision. But there's something very special about Roxanne. And I do think that it was well-deserved that she won um, on Saturday. And it definitely caught me off guard that she won the belt so soon and dethroned Mandy. I thought they were going to play the long run. But surely enough, um, we're going to talk about why this might have happened. Um, now, as far as Mandy goes... Um, when Mandy first came to the WWE, I didn't really, like, pay her much mind. I thought, okay, just another blonde. Or she looks like Trish, so I see why she signed. You know what I mean? Did I watch her on Tough Enough? Yeah. But I don't even think I wanted her to win on Tough Enough. Not that I disliked her. It's just that, um, no, she didn't win. The other, the other girl won. I wanted Mandy to win out of the two. My bad. Scratch that. But as far as Mandy goes, um, she had quite a journey on WWE. 
being like just eye candy, no other personality. Every feud she had just had to do with this is happening because I'm pretty, you know, with Naomi. Mm-hmm. This is happening because I'm fine. Your man can't keep his hands off of me. I think she tried to have a little feud with um, Liv Morgan or, or one of the Riot Squad members, and it was just like a very simplistic, I'm prettier than you or I'm better looking than you, or that you're ugly type of um, back and forth that they had. And, you know, with Otis, she was just more or less an eye candy to elevate Otis. And that's all she just did, which is kind of unfortunate because she wasn't ever a bad wrestler. You know, they just didn't have anything, like, there to attach to this, you know, this gorgeous woman that we're looking at to, like, get us to care. And when she went to NXT... At first, I rolled my eyes because I was just like, oh, they could have put anyone else to lead a faction like Toxic Attraction. They could have went with Alexa. They could have went with Carmella. They could have went with someone who already has a personality. But I just found her to be um, someone that blew me away. Um, she definitely made me believe her over time. Because if you look at in the grand scheme of things when it comes to Mandy, you took she, she took a, a very basic concept of looking the way she looked. She changed her her gimmick just like that. You know, she dyed her hair. She changed up her look. She came up with a faction, or at least WWE attached her to a faction. And I think that was the first ever female faction that we had really going in um, NXT besides, like, you know, the four horsewomen um, or Shayna Baszler's little thing she had with the two MMA girls. You know what I mean? But she came up with a fresh faction, that mixed a little bit of the old with the new. It gave you a little bit of divas, you know, divas era, but it had an edge to it, which was very new. Um, in her reign time, she put over many talents. Yeah, I know it was a long, hefty reign, but she elevated a lot of people. And I do want to say she did bring prestige with time to that title. Because again, not that many people were believing in her. They weren't. They thought that she was just going to do the same tire behind things she was doing the main roster. And over time, you watch growth in her character, where she went from being just a very blank easel to just being this poised, bad bitch character. Like, she just embodied just a badass bitch. Like, yeah, I'm cute. Yeah, I got the body. Yeah, you see my little booty cheeks out and whatever, with this little fit or whatever. <laughs> but I'm a I'm a V-trigger your, your, your face, your, my knee into your face, bitch. You know what I mean? Like, she, like, came in with this whole entire gimmick, and I felt like... I didn't see the vision at first, but probably in the last couple months watching her and then really taking it in. Um, she has to be one one of the better championships we had in NXT history. Am I gonna say she's better than a than than a Sasha or better than an Asuka or a Shayna? No. But respect to the era with how diabolic NXT was, with how schizophrenic it has been, she had to been probably one of the very few saving graces on that show. Mm-hmm. And she had she had a lot of contributions that I think got overlooked that we didn't really take in until just recently. Um, so I'm proud of her. I'm proud that she decided to make that jump and go down into a very, you know, funky looking situation in NXT because no one knew what was, what was happening here. I don't think she even ha- she even knew what was happening, but she went in there believing in herself and She's she's a star, um, and it's unfortunate what had happened to her. Again, we're going to get into what happened to her, but that was a very good reign, and it sucks. It sucks that this happened to her, man, because she was she was just a couple of days from beating Shayna mm-hmm. in terms of the length of her reign. I think she was shy of just a few days, and if they would have gave her one more week, she would have been up there, and I think that was the goal with her. I think that was the goal with her. Um just yeah i hope the best for her i really do hope the best for her wherever she goes she's white hot right now so it's unfortunate that she had lost her title reign but i think she should take full advantage on of of her own empire that she created herself take some notes from miss um, mercedes bernardo and she needs to go elsewhere like she needs to just take that i know i think that with nxt it's, it's either it's 30 days or it's um no uh, it's uh is uh there's no clause there. It's either thirty days or zero, mm. but that's more than enough time with how fresh everything is that had just recently went down, for her to go like make some phone calls and just do a pop up. I think she's good. I think she's good wherever she goes. 
mm-hmm. with the way she built herself up with this title reign and creating her own little legacy. What do you think about Mandy Rose? So first, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to I'm gonna I'm gonna talk Roxanne first and then Mandy. So I think that Roxanne being the first a woman to win first Puerto Rican woman to win the NXT Women's Championship is a very very big deal and and it's very very important. I think that her title reign, her title win was well deserved. I'm very very excited to see where her title reign goes, especially with Cora Jade in the mix. Uh, I definitely see them rekindling their feud sometime down the line. There's that. The fact that she, you know what it is? She is incredibly special. Her title win uh, reminded me of when Tyler Bate won the NXT UK championship when he was 19 years old because he's young. He was young. He was a fresh face, obviously was training for a while, but you can just tell that he just had something that separated him from most, just like she has something that separates her from most. She also won the Ring of Honor World Women's Championship earlier this year. So the fact that she won the, that Ring of Honor World title and the NXT World Women's Championship uh, in the same year is pretty important. I think it's pretty, pretty dope. Um, and also, I just thought it was really, really adorable, the interaction between her and Booker. Uh, Booker has been like a father figure to her. He trained her or like she trained at his school. So to see their interaction, to see Booker overwhelmed, I think was a very, very special moment. But shout outs to Roxanne. I think that her title win was well deserved. The way that they pulled it off, I thought that it was going to happen a little bit later. But nevertheless, I'm glad. So congratulations to Roxanne. Now, as it pertains to Mandy Rose and her championship reign, she is easily top five NXT women's champions of all time. My opinion, I believe that Asuka is number one. I believe that Rhea, Shayna are both up there as well. I think that um, Sasha Banks' reign is up there. And then I think it's Mandy. Um, I do believe that the fact that Mandy held that title with such grace and such poise with a reinvented version of herself with a, a faction like Toxic Attraction who saw their fair share of success as well because Gigi and JC were able to win tag team championship gold they were the closest thing to undisputed era since undisputed era because of their dominance their continuity their fluidity their look their ability to capture the nxt audience and to be honest this past year and a half has probably been one of the most unstable years in the company's history because first vince wanted to rebrand nxt and then after nxt was rebranded all the sexual allegations came back then hunter wanted to kind of go back to how nxt was and take away the rainbows and mandy was there through it all mandy was there through it all and she was able to elevate talent in spite of everything that 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 happened and she turned herself into one of the premier um talents in wwe of all brands and i believe that what happened in nxt molded her into the perfect women's wrestler for the american market she had the in-ring capabilities the in-ring storytelling uh that you would see from any top performer and she had the sex appeal of trish stratus and i believe that she she had a, I, she mandy definitely reminds me a little of Shawn michaels she's the heartbreak girl right like from her her poise, the way she carries herself, like she she gives me Sean, like in like ninety seven, like just like I'm just I'm just bad, I'm just attractive as hell, and I'm gonna be in the ring, and I'm gonna I'm gonna you know do what I do, and I'm gonna look good doing it, like it. So like that, I think that that's Mandy's legacy. Now, <laughs> here we go. So so speaking of Mandy Rose, um yeah. Speaking of Mandy Rose, um, <laughs> on the opposite side of the victory, on the opposite side of um, of of Roxanne Perez winning the WWE NXT Women's Championship, we also saw a major, major blow in the women's roster. As Fightful had reported that WWE has released Mandy Rose. Uh, prior to her release, there were reports and rumblings and leaks of Mandy posting not safe for work content behind a paywall on an OnlyFans style site. Uh, things were leaked, as I said earlier. Um, more as 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 the release happened, more details started to come out. Um, you know, there were there are many 
details surrounding this, like considering the fact that she took a pay cut when she went down to NXT uh, and that she was making more money on this site than she was as a pro wrestler. Um, that um, part of the reason why there was a release involved was because it breached uh, a an agreement that she had with Mattel. Um, but nevertheless, she was released. And I wanted to know what your thoughts and impressions were on this. And I know you're going to go blood. So I got my water. I saved just enough. I'm going to be more calm about it since it's been like a day. Because... Got to get close to the mic. It it just pisses me off just because, like... There's there's a plethora of reasons why it pisses me off. It's just, okay, A. I don't see what's the issue with people in this company. Like, what what's what's the issue with this company and uh, with people having their own like side hustles? You know what I mean? Mm. That's all our OnlyFans was, and I saw what the leaks were. I think everyone like was curious to see what's what was it about. And by the way, fuck you to the fan that um still posted the shit, even though Mandy reached out to the DMs and politely asked for the leaks to be taken down. That was fucked up. Um. It's not like she was just posting them shits. She opened it up and it was behind a paywall. And some asshole went ahead, paid for it, and you know, like they knew what, that they were gonna be risking her job by posting that, and they did. And that just really pissed me off because y'all don't respect women. Like y'all really don't fucking respect women. You should be happy that she even wanted to 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 uh, get into this line of work, and she wanted to share that part of her life with you guys and like look what y'all do within the first fucking day of the shit dropping like y'all are fucking disgusting so that's one thing that pisses me off about this to this fucking garbage company because like i feel like if they're not making money off of it they they don't want you doing anything i mean we saw this whole issue with Zelina vega when she opened up only fans or what other um people when they had Twitch accounts or what I mean. I feel like this company is so money hungry. And if they if they were profiting off of her having it too, you know what I mean? Then I feel like they probably would have let it slide. Um the thirdly, Mandy like Mandy having an OnlyFans only makes more sense to her and her character because she's always been built as a sex symbol since literally tough enough through wwe i just want a whole tangent about how um you know they had her coming out to like this goddess music and having her in slow motion they were always sexualizing her you know Mm. what i mean how we they had a whole storyline where she was butt-ass naked in the towel she wasn't naked you know she obviously she revealed herself in um a ring gear underneath the towel but like they always sexualized her and it's just like okay i know i'm good looking and i'm not making that much money while i'm doing at this point being an nxt is like a passion project for her which is mm-hmm. fucked up because, again, she was on the main roster. She's been in this company for many years. I would imagine that if she went to NXT, there would have been, like, some type of conversation with her getting paid or trying to match the pay that she would get up there, considering that, yeah, she's going down here, but look at all the work she's doing while there's a clusterfuck down here in NXT. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And she, it's not like she did it off rip as soon as she went down to nxt she put in like a, almost two years worth of work down there mm-hmm. sacrificing herself her time her body um you know trying to bring some uh, prestige to this belt and doing everything that this company asks for it just makes me upset because it's just like all she was just trying to do is make a little extra money and i don't know if she was struggling paying her bills with the fucking salary i don't know what's the salary down in nxt do you know you have any idea what salary is? I have no idea. None. No. Well, obviously, it ain't enough if people are out here making OnlyFans. It's just like, what's the issue? Because in other companies, like in, in AEW or whatnot, I think Tay Conti just recently opened up one. And they make good bread over there. You know what I mean? Yep. It's just like, wrestling fans already sit there and sexualize them for free. I think it's brilliant for them to profit off of them. And I said this before months ago in the podcast that OnlyFans is honestly one of the most brilliant freaking platforms to ever drop for women because men on the internet or fans in general don't know how to control themselves when it comes down to the female form. So I don't blame her for doing that, for opening up and and doing it with her husband. 
It looked like she was having fun and enjoying herself and she was just tapping into a different side of her. And again, it still made sense. It still would have made sense with her on-screen character. So to me, it was just, it was weird. And I thought that even if they had a disagreement or it did breach a contract, it didn't seem it didn't seem like they gave her any room to at least have like a discussion about this or put some parameters on her content. You know what I mean? Like I feel like something most definitely could have been worked out, but they were so quick to ax her. And it's just like, bruh, for how many years have y'all been sexualizing your women in the WWE? It gave me like China vibes off rip. It reminded me of when Triple H didn't want to induct China by herself into the Hall of Fame. Well, not not Triple H that Vince McMahon or Triple H made made a comment on some podcast or some interview about his thoughts on China going to the Hall of Fame, and then he tried bringing up saying that if his daughter or son were to type in China into like the you know Google or whatnot, they're gonna see that type of stuff. And it's like, bruh, do I have to explain Sunny again? Do I have to explain Sunny again? <laughs> like, she's a documented racist, documented anti-Semitic. She actually has an OnlyFans too at this point in time. Don't know if it's active because since she's in jail for killing an old man. Um, but she literally was um around around the time frame, even like when they gave her the Hall of Fame ring, she was still doing stuff online and she was known to be very promiscuous for her body. You know what I mean? And it was like no secret to anyone. This is before OnlyFans came out that she was over here using her body and profiting off her body or just doing this flirtatious things with 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 her fans you know i mean and like this this girl got a hall of fame ring and then it's going back to china it's just like you really just like washed out her whole entire legacy and everything she done brought to the table because of something she did in in a phase that she was going through in a midst of probably like a mental breakdown like when you type in china into the motherfucking keyboard all I see is just WWF, WWE shit from China. You know what I mean? It's really like not at the top of your list unless you actually are, are typing in certain type of titles to find that that China content. So like the idea of just like canceling her because, not canceling her, firing her because it's not good for a PG um concept or that if you look up Mandy Rose, it's going to come up and that's not good for business or for our stocks or da 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 It's bullshit. She's a grown ass woman. Let her do what she wants to do with her body. You know what I mean? Uh, if anything, it would have actually helped the company. That could have been a nice door. If they would have had an agreement with her and said that, hey, you could keep it, let's keep some parameters on this bitch, that actually could have been a nice little door with WWE. Because look at the way it's been working out in AEW. People are very much happy over there, you know, having full range of what they could do with themselves and marketing herself. She probably just wanted to do another business move. And that could have been a beautiful thing if they just would have allowed her to do that. And I just feel like, it's weird because in some some cases I do see growth with WWE, but I do see it in other ways that they do like to keep their keep their um keep their talents like on on a tight leash. And I just thought it was cruel. I thought it was messed up. Um, she took it like a champ. I know that that had to suck to know that you invested so much into this company, so much into your character. Um, your body has been through hell, and she also, by the way, experienced the death of her brother very recently bro i could only imagine what was going through her head that she literally did all this for nothing but at the same time i look at it as a blessing in disguise because they got rid of her when she was or is white hot and like i said before if they don't got a clause or it's 30 days or less she really could appear anywhere she could have appeared on on aew last night when Paige said she was looking for a partner and that's still possible. That's still possible. They could they could get uh, Absolution back together right now. And she could be the draw. Perhaps she could go to AEW right now. She, if she makes that phone call right now or Tony Khan makes that phone call right now, you know, we could see her dethrone Jay Cargill and it would make sense because of how, how she built herself up in NXT. You know what I mean? Like, she's that girl over there. You know, she... She could really, like I said, be taking notes from from Sasha at this point. And it's like, all right, you guys are going to remove me off of this? Fuck that. Fuck that. Fuck you. I'm going to take Mandy Rose or Amanda, rebrand myself, and I'm going to take this elsewhere, and I'm going to be that girl. I'm still going to be that girl. Like, you can't just box me in. Do you have a point? Hello? I don't hear you. Are you <coughs> muted? 
Yeah, my mic was off. My bad. I was speaking. I thought and something I, was wrong with my headphones. I was like, oh, no, we're not going to do this again. I'm no. sorry. No, 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 my, my, my mic was My mic was off, but I... <laughs> I was going to say, funny thing is, literally, as you were talking about it, a notification popped up and Mandy Rose has a statement. Oh, Lord. She says, hey, guys, thank Ooh. you for all the messages. I am overwhelmed with the love and support from you guys. And don't worry, the page is still up. I know that's right. <laughs> thank you, Tony. Let me, so let me, thank um, you, Tony. let me, uh, let me, let me, let me, because I have notes. Okay. I have notes on, on. what I Go what on. I feel about Mandy Rose. So let's start with here. From a business perspective, firing Mandy Rose was probably one of the dumbest things that WWE has ever done. Let's start there mm-hmm. from a business perspective. I'll go into the morality aspect later. From a business perspective, firing Mandy Rose was one of the dumbest things that WWE can do. Why? Because they fired their Ja Morant. They fired their Jason Tatum. Someone who is a young star who has the potential... Uh, to be a face of the company for years to come. She was in NXT. She successfully re- reinvented herself. Had one of the longest reigns in the history of that brand and was able to become a great in-ring performer with the sex appeal of someone like a Trish Stratus. She was molded into being the perfect American market-friendly women's professional wrestler, and they gave her away for free. You gave her away. Yep. You took your youngest brightest star and you gave her away put things into perspective um matt riddle was tested positive like had had a positive drug test for something that wasn't weed because they don't test for weed anymore and you suspended him but you let mandy go for breaching contract even though taking drugs is also a breach of contract but we're going to keep going This also puts JC and Gigi in a very compromising position because Toxic Attraction was main roster ready. They were going to the main roster. And because, you know, Mandy was the anchor of that group, that kind of puts them in a very, very difficult position. So we're going to see what happens with them. But it sucks because JC and Gigi are incredibly talented. You know what I'm saying? And and to kind of see them without their anchor sucks. Um. So then there's that. But there were a couple things that I I, I picked from this situation. Number one, that this was an optics issue. WWE is a PG company, right? They have PG products on Raw, on SmackDown. NXT is considered PG, right? And I think that part of the reason why they released Mandy the way that they did was because, oh, we don't want someone who is consciously posting adult content and putting it behind a paywall because um, it's a bad look for our partners, our investors, or whatever the case may be. And one of the common arguments that I've heard is like, well, you got Ricochet out. There's videos of pretty much of everybody. Ricochet, Matt Riddle has pictures. Paige and Xavier Woods, for the love of God, have adult content out. I think that the problem at... <laughs> Yo. I think that the, the problem at hand was... The fact that all of these things were meant to be private in the sense of this was an interpersonal thing. I think that was only supposed to be kept between certain people. Uh, Whereas Mandy's content was just like, I'm going to do this publicly, but I'm going to keep it low. Um, But I think that this is more about an optics issue than it was a morality issue. Because no, 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 and we understand that the whole WWE Playboy and 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 all this other stuff, and I, I don't think that it was, you know, I, I think that honestly it was just the way that things looked as opposed to the way things are. But I feel like situations like this reveal kind of the hypocritical nature of it all, right? Like once again, Matt Riddle tested positive for drugs. This is his second time, and he's not being released from the company. He's also had sexual assault allegations. There's been multiple people in the company that have had sexual assault men, specifically men, who have had rape allegations, sexual assault allegations put against him. For the love of God, Jimmy Uso got a DUI, and then the next week popped up on TV and got a tag team championship match and won the tag titles. So for you to have a company that have people that have multiple allegations of them of committing rape, 
of committing sexual assault and and they're still in the company some are in prominent positions in the company and then you fire Mandy Rose for posting adult content behind a paywall I think it's wrong I think it's wrong and I think it's disgusting and like even down to like the whole like my bad I just wanted to to make sure I get all my 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 notes in there cuz like like no, you on a roll it, keep going Like, I think it's wrong. And the fact that, you know, there have been, you know, things pointed out of Charlotte on the body issue of ESPN, you know, and I don't think that like that was a different presentation of the the female form. And I think that because it was something that was more pop culture friendly and something that wasn't necessarily sexually suggestive, she gets more grace for it. However, that doesn't change the fact that there is a double standard being revealed through this situation, that there is a form of misogyny, that you are sending an implicit message that we can sexualize you, but the moment that you understand the power of your sexuality and profit off of it, separate and apart from us, then we have to take action that doesn't doesn't benefit you in the end. So I think it's unjust. I think that it's wrong. I also think that uh, now they're saying, well, Reports are saying that like WWE is open to Mandy Rose returning. Oh no, sis is not coming. I, I would be surprised if sis came back. If I'm Mandy Rose and I'm looking at the professional wrestling landscape and I'm realizing Tay Conti is in AEW doing what she want to do. I'm realizing there's people in all different forms of companies doing what they want to do and like with having their OnlyFans accounts, having their fan time accounts, doing all that. I'm I'm looking to leave. You just released me, the woman who held down one of your brands for 413 days, who built a new faction, who became the face of a company, who is now white hot because now there's all this press and there's all this speculation surrounding me. And you think I'm going to try to go back to you? No, 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 no. You shot yourself in the foot, bro. Like you played yourself. If anything... If anything, and I understand it's an optics issue, you have a PG product, but there's just certain things you could have just suspended her. Could have suspended her for 30 days, yeah. put it through <laughs> sensitivity training, something, and she would have been, and and at least you still would have been able from a business perspective to still be able to control the Mandy Rose narrative and still be in a position where she can garner you money in the future. But... By firing her, you just told the wrestling world, hey, y'all want a, a, a woman's champion with, do you want a woman who can be a woman's champion, the face of your brand, and has sex appeal, and is white hot right now, and that can appeal to that, appeal to that 18 to 45, 49 male demographic? Y'all, y'all want that? Here, for free. Here you go. Mm-hmm. Free. You can, have, you can have her. That's mm-hmm. That's just bad business. That's just horrible business. And then people aren't going to want to, people are not going to really want to invest in this company. If they, if they can see if that's how they're willing to do Mandy, like, as you just said, she's the face of a whole brand. Like, you think that's going to make people want to, like, extend their contracts? Like, people are asking what's Gigi and JC going to do. They probably are, are thinking about joining their girl wherever she goes because that probably makes them feel very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It probably makes a lot of females feel uncomfortable. You know, I mean, of- it was one thing when it happened with Zelina because she was at like a she was at a lower level, and I don't think she really was doing much of anything besides just still being like a valet or something like that. But like for your on screen women's champion that's been on pay per view after pay per view after pay per view nonstop, no breaks, nothing unless she got an injury or whatnot. That's insane. If I was a female in WWE, that would make me think twice about mm. how hard I want to like commit myself to this company, to my character, to chasing that belt because I could be taken away just like that. Mm. And they shot and- themselves in the in the foot in so many ways. Go ahead. And 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 not to mention the fact that part of the reason why this page was active is because is because she took a pay cut. She took a pay cut to go down to NXT. So obviously she's not making that much money. So you're telling me 
that you can chop off a good amount of my salary. But the moment that I try to compensate for the money that I lost to help you, now I get fired. And what's really going to be damaging is in 20 years when WWE decides that it's that it's 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 safe to be sex positive. Right? Cuz now it's 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 popular and it's cool to advocate for representation and diversity and equity and inclusion. The next wave that's going to be corporate friendly is in 10 to 20 15 years, 10 15 20 years when everybody is advocating for being sex positive. So what's going to be the narrative in 20 years when you want to induct Mandy Rose into the Hall of Fame and she refuses and then people are going to call you out because the moment that y'all had a sex worker in your company or, or, or supposedly or allegedly had a sex worker in your company, you let her go. You let her go. So, yes, even from a brand perspective, you damaged yourself and you shot yourself in the foot because the next wave is sex positive and you just fired someone who is a sex worker. So I just, I just, it, there's a lot of layers and nuances to this. And I understand that WWE was trying to play it safe for their, for their, for their, for their partners and, and investors, but dog, you, you got people on your roster with DUIs holding tag team championships. Let's not try to, let's not try to act like we have a moral compass all of a sudden. I was going to say, did you have anything else to say? Nah, that was very well put. This man, this company's in the dumps, bro. <laughs> like, it's not in the really dumps, in but the dumps. they're not in the dumps. They're doing a lot of things well, but there's still a lot to to have to, for them to figure out, and they're just gonna have to figure it's it out. Just but. you just helped out AEW so much, and it's it's <laughs> insane. Like their turnaround since the medium scrum is actually really insane. <laughs> Literally, like night and day. But yeah. moving on. Like, but moving on. Um, so, speaking of women's wrestlers, Mia Yim deactivated her Twitter. Uh, she posted a picture of uh, being held by Austin Theory, uh, and it was heavily scrutinized online, uh, be- you know, because she's married to Keith Lee. I don't know if you've caught wave of this, but I wanted to know your impressions or your thoughts, because I thought this was another very, very interesting situation. Um, all right. How do I go about this? I mean, was I like cracking jokes in private? Yeah, but I wasn't like taking nothing above this seriously. Do I think it's personally awkward objectively looking at a photo and seeing a woman have her legs wrapped around another man that isn't her man when she's married? That was a little bit odd, but every friendship is different. Am I a fan of Austin Theory in, you know, as a person? Not quite, not at all. Um, but I feel like the part that I guess bothers me the most about it. I'm assuming if she did that and she posted the picture and she posted a, like a professional shot photo, it looked like you know WWE's um camera crew took a picture of it. I would assume if she was that bold to do that, then she has a different relationship with her husband to where they could they could express themselves as they like with their friends if there isn't anything weird going on i don't know what was the comments that was being said about mia yim but if i could have just imagine based off of how toxic twitter is they probably blamed her more than austin theory or they probably be inappropriate jokes saying that like you know they're probably doing you know what like behind closed doors or actually not even behind closed door in front of key's face or whatnot and they probably most likely blame mia more so than austin theory which it tends to be like that in every single situation. Like the female always gets blamed for all the stuff. And personally, when I looked at it, yeah, I cracked a few jokes, but I didn't think they were anything more than friends. Any anything, yeah, anything more than just being friends. Um, the fact she had she had to deactivate is really sad, man. It's really sad because a lot of fans don't know how to mind their business, but then you can also make the argument that, oh, well, she puts her business out there that she's married to Keith. You know, she should respect him. It's just like, that's not up to you to decide what's respect and not respect in that relationship. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's between the two of them, and they're going to deal with it the way they want to deal with it. Again, I, I'm assuming that she just posted it, that Keith is cool with it, and he's probably used to it or has seen stuff like this before from Mia, 
and that he probably knows of their their bond. You know, best friends or regular friends express themselves in all types of ways. Um, it's just another matter of people needing to mind their own motherfucking business. And this is why wrestlers don't like sharing their lives with us because they give us an inch and we run a mile with that bitch. And yeah, some people could have just been cracking jokes just to crack jokes, but these people have feelings at the end of the day. She probably posted that picture thinking that, oh, here's me with my buddy. Yeah, it's a controversial figure or whatnot. But yeah, here's me with my buddy. Ha ha ha, guys, look at us. And then people literally just flipped it and twisted it. And we don't even know what that probably could have turned into. We don't know if they caused an argument to happen between Keith Lee and Mia, which is fucked up. It's really fucked up because I'm sure that wasn't her intention. You know what I mean? You all Mm -hmm. probably made her question herself as a woman. I don't know what Mia's history is like with herself or her relations with men before. I had heard many things, but I'm not going to comment on things because at the end of the day, she's a grown ass woman. That's her own motherfucking body. She's entitled to do what right. the fuck she wants to do with it. At the end of the day, no one should be policing their marriage. All right. That's up to them. Leave that woman the fuck alone. I'm sick of you guys on Twitter trying to be the police of everyone's relationship and clocking people on this and that. It's, it's none of your business. Why do you care? <laughs> Right. baby why do you care that, that that's not your walls being beat up <laughs> it's not your dick getting sucked why do you care <laughs> I, like, y'all, I, y'all piss me off i'm a i'm a Go jump ahead. in on, i'm a jump in on this if it's not your business why do you care like if it's not your marriage why do you care it like at the end of the day at the end of the day, most of these cats that are on Twitter talking about these people don't even be in relationships, but want to have agency over somebody else's. And it just, it boggles my mind that, it boggles my mind that you don't know the details of Keith Lee and Mia Yim's marriage. You don't even really care about Keith Lee and Mia Yim's marriage. You don't really care about the friendship between Austin Theory and Mia Yim. You just see an opportunity to absolutely try and publicly humiliate somebody else. That's what it is. And that's the reason why I I draw such an ire to it, is because this is not about the friendship between Austin Theory and Mia Yim. This is not about the between the marriage of Keith Lee. If y'all was so, if y'all was so concerned about the marriage between Keith Lee and Mia Yim, how many of y'all were congratulating them when they got married? Probably none of y'all. Probably none of y'all were there congratulating them on their marriage or when they got together. Y'all just see an opportunity to publicly humiliate another woman. And then you take and because you do it for and y'all do it for everybody else. Y'all do it for every any and every woman that 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 tries to get online and tries to make something of herself. You you like and, and this is the reason why I draw such an issue to it is because. Number one, you don't know the details of their marriage or their relationship. And it I would assume that that's something that was talked about between them before it even even reached the Internet. And it was already cool with them. But two is that a lot of y'all want to have a moral compass and, and, and talk about how inappropriate stuff is. But in reality, your intentions aren't to hold people accountable your intentions are to make fun of other women and disrespect and humiliate other women, especially women of color. Because when every time, any time a, a, a woman of color does something in public, it's everybody's news. It's everybody's business. Everybody want to chime in. Everybody want to contribute. But had this, I swear this would, this would not have happened with Alexa or Carmella or any of them. But I just, my, my issue is just. with Carmella. She had a whole cheating situation. I didn't know that she had a whole wasn't cheating situation. Wasn't she the situation. other woman? Huh? Doesn't that, wasn't, Car, wasn't Corey Graves, uh, Corey Graves cheated on his wife with Carmella? That with was Carmella. years ago. With years, oh yeah, 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 yeah. But at the same time, it's like, I like, it's, once again, it's none of your business. It's none of your business. It's not your marriage. It's not your relationship. And everybody has different rules and regulations and processes about their relationship and guess what it's completely their business and it's not up to y'all or us for us to have any agency over that so i, I definitely want to send my love to to mia yim uh, because i know how unfortunate and how annoying that can be but moving on so 
on Thursday, WrestleVotes reported that the waves of rehired talent by Triple H brought back has underperformed and underwhelmed Triple H. Do you believe that the talent Hunter has brought back into the company has been of value to the company? I believe that the talent Hunter brought back into the company has been of value. I'll be honest. He brought back to me some people that I think are a little useless. Like, okay, with EO and Dakota Kai, great selections. Love what he's doing. Um, love the fact that he paired them as a faction with Bailey. However, um, they kind of sizzle out kind of fast, not because they're underperforming, but because the women's division has already been in shambles that it's not going to take just one person to fix it. You know what I mean? Like there's so right. much work to clean up with the women that it unfortunately made them suffer. Um, I think that if they went to NXT where over there um, they would have had more women to play with because they had more characters and stuff like that and introduce them around there, maybe they would have had a different experience. I mean, they could have just, like, tussled with Toxic Attraction or whatnot, just 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 to bring more interest or whatnot. But he had the right idea. He most certainly had the right idea with the signs that he had. It's just that you need star power at this point. You can't just bring in other side names that had their first run in WWE that some people either didn't know because they didn't watch NXT or they kind of flopped in their run in NXT. So it's it's coming off like they're just throwing in names and they're just throwing shit at the wall and trying to make it stick. But do I think that the individual talents are underperforming? Absolutely not. I just think that they're scrambling. And they're going to continue to scramble until if Sasha and Naomi choose to come back um, and they work around that. Or Charlotte comes back. Like They need they need like a big name to come out to work with the newer talents. That's, that's how you get them over, right? It's like right. with Chris Jericho and that the jobber from last night. That literally last night they had um, jobber chants. I forgot what it was, but like Let's that's how you normally jobber. do it yeah. when you're bringing people back. Yeah, that's what it was. Let's go jobber. You know what I mean? That's how you normally do it. And yeah, they attached them to Bailey. So that already gave them shine, but the talent that they were working with, it was just like, eh, like they, you, you attach Bianca to Alexa, which uh, uh, you had the right idea with Asuka, but uh, next to Alexa, like how was that gonna? That don't that that faction don't make a sense. Therefore, this feud don't make a sense, which means that I won't care as a fan. Hmm. So I don't I don't want to blame Hunter for this one. I don't. It's just like you can't be mad at somebody for trying to like slowly build back together something that's had no organization, no nothing. It's going to take time. So mm -hmm. I don't think people should pass judgment so fast. Like it's going to take a year before we can actually revisit this conversation. What do you think? I agree wholeheartedly. I think, and not just with the women, but just in general, right? Like bringing back, they brought back Braun, they brought back Hit Row, they brought back Tegan Knox, they brought back so many different names and, all of these people can be of value to the company. And I think that they have performed as best as they could. But I feel like WWE is still in a rebuilding mode under Triple H because you have to undo what Vince did. And then you have to build on top of a new foundation. And I feel like that's across all boards because Vince, you know, all intents and purposes, he kind of destroyed Hunter's baby with NXT and made it an NXT 2.0. So now that has to be rebranded and redone. Then Raw has to be rebranded and redone. Then SmackDown has to be rebranded and redone. And you have to continue to build on the things that were already successful and continue to make those work while restructuring everything else. I don't think that that's a ma necessarily a talent problem. And also just bringing in talent and just seeing what works and what doesn't work. I feel like there's so many cases where they have elements of something, but they need something else. For example, for example, Hit Row needs a leader. We'll talk about that at a later show at a later date. But I think that there are so many things, there are so many cases in which there are elements of, of something there, but it's just there's just something missing, or there's just something that that needs to be added to it to give it a little bit more oomph. But those are things that can be discovered and dealt with over time. So I don't I don't want to make it seem as if um it's impossible or that this is a talent issue. It, there's 
it takes a team, right? They say teamwork makes the dream work. And I feel like in this case, there are multiple facets of a team that have to come together to make certain things work, especially when it comes to the restructuring and the rebuilding of, of WWE. So that's just my, my little take on it. Um, and last but not least, um, a report began to circulate um, a couple of days ago that Kevin Owens made a pitch for a Shawn Michaels match. How would you feel about seeing Kevin Owens and Shawn Michaels in the ring? I don't want to see Shawn Michaels ever again. <laughs> let me say this. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm leaning back. Let me, let me say this again. I don't think I want to see Shawn Michaels inside of a ring ever again. I'm sorry. Um, I can't even say he's a caricature of his former self because he looks nothing like his former self. And like, it sounds mm. really fucked up to say, but I'm going to say it because of how I feel. Um, the Shawn Michaels I grew up with, all right, was charming. Um, he had like the flowing hair. He did not have a lazy eye, or at least maybe he had a lazy eye on the way out. Um, he had the build going on. It went with the sexy boy gimmick, all right? Like, you can't help but to attach the two together. And now when I see him, he looks like someone's granddad or, like, first uncle. Like, <laughs> all the pictures I see him hugging the people that he trained, man. And I'm just like, damn, like, would it sound great? You know, had he looked the way he looked before, if I was imagining a Shawn Michaels from 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Mm. I'd be down. I'd be down. But man, after I watched what went down in Crown Jewel with uh, Brothers of Destruction versus DX, I never want to see a bald Shawn Michaels. I think he's not even bald right now. I think he just has like a bald patch in the middle of his head, with, like little hairs on the side, like a, like a Q-tip. And it's just like I don't want. I don't want to see that. That honestly ruined my childhood. Like normally, like bringing back a legend is supposed to like ignite something in your childhood and that nostalgia factor. Now nah, that shit killed it. That shit stomped it right the fuck out. I was like, damn, I'm mm. old. Because that's how old this man looks. He's that fucking old that I feel old. And it's not even that. It's not even that. But as, like, two entities would have been great. Visually, I just, I I don't want to see it. Someone out there wants to see it. I don't want to see it. What do you think? I, um, personally, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Just because we've seen... Kevin Owens and Stone Cold and it was doper than we expected it to be. He looks like Stone Cold still. <laughs> yeah, but still, I, I, you know what it is? I, I will never ever, Shawn Michaels to me is one of the greatest of all time. And regardless of what shape he, he's in or what he looks like, um, I'll still be down to see a Shawn Michaels in-ring match. That man is just, he's so goaded and he's so good and you know, I, j- I feel like it would be very, very interesting to see how they go about it. Um, but I think that I would be interested in seeing that. But once again, I the goal, the path to it is what intrigues me. How are we going to get there? But, you know, we'll see about that. But a Kevin Owens, Shawn Michaels match isn't exactly the worst idea, especially if, if Kevin Owens is still going to talk down on Texas and all that. If that is a thing that he wants to return to that can be a path towards it. But, you know, I still think that Shawn Michaels is one of the greatest of all time. One of the most influential, easily the most influential of our generation, considering how many of these cats is just throwing super kicks left and right. Just God, just, but I, I, I want to super be... kick the young bucks. <laughs> no, I but I, I, I think that, um, <laughs> I, I, it's just something that would intrigue me and that would interest me. And that's, that's really all I have to say about that. But how would y'all feel about a Kevin Owens Shawn Michaels match? I would personally like it. I don't know if anybody else would, but I would I would be intrigued by it. But that concludes our show for today. Thank you guys so much for joining episode 21. I know this is another banger, another long one, but we will see you guys next week. 